wanted to show you this slide because this is a really great part of the lesson that I want to share with you. So neonate means a brand newborn. So as you can see, I told you that we're born with most all the neurons that we're ever going to have. But what changes throughout life are, what do you see? It's the dendritic branching. The dendritic branching. So what happens to the dendrites, and we can go back to this picture, is when the child is born, they have basically all the neurons that they're going to have. They're going to add more in the first year of life, but they are born with the majority of the neurons they're going to have. And then what happens is, is these dendrites start growing and branching, growing and branching. So here we go. Brand newborn. We've got the neurons. But what we don't have is we don't have the dendritic branching. So what happens throughout life is we're growing the dendrites. And if we don't use a certain pathway of dendrites in the brain, then what they do is they kind of retract. Think of it kind of, now that's where you can kind of think of the brain as a muscle. I am not saying that the brain is a muscle. There is no muscle tissue in the brain. But if you want to think of it as a metaphor, you can. Is the brain, um, it will grow and retract, use it or lose it. If you use a certain pathway, then that becomes stronger. If you don't use a pathway, then the dendrites kind of retract, and they kind of other dendritic pathways will pass over them, and so those that particular pathway may be lost. So let's 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 see the dendritic branching and the five schools of psychology. So you should have. You should have it pretty firmly ingrained in your mind. If not, we'll continue to go back to these five schools throughout the entire uh, le through the out the entire course. And remember, you're going to be probably writing a paper on these five schools of psychology. But when you look at the five schools of psychology, we were talking about that these are different ways to explain behavior. And a lot of psychology uh, doesn't offer concrete answers, but it causes you to ask more questions. And so these are the ways that we would describe behavior. So we had biological. Well, that's what we're studying right now, is we're studying kind of the biological psychology. That's what this chapter two is. And so biological psychology seeks to explain behavior in terms of the brain and genes and hormones. That's what we're doing, is we're trying to explain, okay, how does the brain relate to behavior? And I just said, okay, um, all of your thoughts, all of your moods are caused by chemicals in the brain. So right now we're working on biological psychology, but I wanted to take this opportunity to show you how this dendritic branching right here can, ex can give credibility to all five schools of psychology, is that I don't believe that just one of these schools ever has the final say. So let's see. Okay. So we know that a child is born with most of the nerve cells that they're going to have, and that is genetically determined. So we know that when we come into this world, we are born with a certain body type. I think most of us would agree with that. Probably, since the brain is just an organ of the body, each one of us is born with certain patterns of nerve cells, certain nerve cells, certain amount of nerve cells, and certain areas of the brain. It's just like when a baby is born, they're born with certain muscle mass or certain fat mass or something on their body their brain is born with nerve cells, um, more nerve cells in a certain area than not a certain area, and so on and so forth. So there we go. We explain biology. We know that our genes, just like they determine kind of our body type, would also determine the structure of our brain a bit. Now, behaviorism. Behaviorism says it's determined by learning in the environment. Let me show you this study. So I want you to picture we've got we've got two groups of rats. One group of rats, when they are born, they're put in an environment that's very stimulating. Look, you got a ball, you got a little toy car, here's another stimulating environment, they've got a little castle, lots of things, and look, they're all together. They're all, the rats are together. They're, there's no rats in here, but they're all put together. Okay, so from the moment of birth, these rats, you know, when they can start taking care of themselves, they are put in these this environment, an enriched environment, with lots of toys, and they can all play with one another. It's like kind of like a rat's Disneyland. Now, 
picture another group of rats that they're all put in solitary cages like this. There's no toys in here, it's just a wire cage, they get fed, and they don't get to hang out with one another. So they keep them in these two environments for approximately three weeks. Let me just say that again. They keep this in, they start out in these two environments and they keep them in these segments for about two weeks. And then what they do is using scientific procedures, they are going to examine their brains. The, the rats in the enriched environment versus the rats in the impoverished environment. What do you think they found? Well, what they found is the rats that were in an impoverished environment are going to have shorter dendrites, not as much branching. The rats that are put in an enriched environment are going to have structures more like this, with lots of dendritic branching, lots of dendritic growth. So, the reason why I'm giving you that study is, look, that gives credence to behaviorism. Behaviorism is, behavior is determined by learning in the environment. We have found evidence for that. If we put you in a very stimulating environment, then we know that increased dendritic branching is occurring. And in fact, probably a lot of you are saying, you know, why do we have to go to school and have all these general requirements? I mean, I am never going to use political science or I'm never going to use calculus. I'm not going to do that. What you want to think of college as is college is actually like an exercise gym for the brain is by stimulating all these different pathways and creating this, what, what's actually happening to you is you're diversifying your brain. Where someone who doesn't go to college and doesn't have a lot of stimulation, they don't have as much variability in the brain. Here, by you constantly pushing yourself to learn this and exposing yourself to learn this, you're creating more and more pathways in your brain. But you say, oh, but wait, as soon as I finish college, I'm not going to remember any of this. And I agree with you, you probably will not remember a lot of what you learn in college. But the thing is, is once you've laid a pathway, once you created that pathway, yes, it will retract. That's what happens. If you don't use it, it will retract. But just that you actually had a pathway there, if you ever need that information again, it's much easier for you to relearn it. All right, let's see about cognitive. Now, how can we explain this? Well, cognitive says that our behavior is determined by our thought processes. So let me go back. Guess what? Guess what actually causes your dendrites to grow? is you have to repeatedly stimulate them. And how do you repeatedly stimulate them? By thinking about things. By thinking about things. So if we go, let, let's go back right here. Oops. Let's say that you, the cognitive school of thought says you create your world with your thoughts, right? So let's say right here you tell yourself, I'm stupid. And you keep thinking that, I'm stupid, I'm stupid, I'm stupid, I'm stupid, I'm stupid. Eventually what you're going to do is you're going to make a very I'm stupid pathway right here. And so then that, since that pathway becomes very strong, here let me show you another picture. Look, here's a very strong pathway. See how thick it is? You're more likely to use this pathway than something small right here, right? So if you keep telling yourself, if you keep thinking the thought again and again, I, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, it's impossible, it's impossible, it's impossible, that becomes your dominant pathway and you just jump on it automatically. But right now, right now, I really want you to try this. I want you to try to think two thoughts at once. I think you'll find that it's impossible to think two thoughts at once. Yes, you can flip back very quickly, but it's impossible to think two thoughts at once. So with knowing this, and that you're actually, by thinking certain thoughts, you're actually creating thicker pathways in your brain, and then that becomes the nature of the, I mean, because what would you do? Look at these as pathways. If you were driving a car, would you take these back road side streets or would you probably just get on the main pathway? But by you saying, every time that you have a negative thought or something that's not working well for you, by you saying, no, 
I'm not going to think about that. I'm going to think positive. Then eventually you can restructure the brain. Is it going to be easy? No, it's not going to be easy. But is it possible? It's possible. Because you're the one that controls the thoughts. When a negative thought pops in your head, you're the one that can say, no, I'm not going to strengthen that pathway. I'm going to think something positive. Even though I've had these negative thoughts inside of me, I control what I think about. All right, let's go on to the humanistic. Behavior is determined by our choices. Well, that's school of thought. What do our th choices cause? I think our choices cause the environment that we're in. We choose to be in this environment or that environment. We choose who we let in and out of our environment. And also, our choices will affect our thought processes. If we choose to undertake something that we're not good at, then we usually get negative feedback. If we choose to allow people in our lives that put us down all the time, then that affects this. So I believe the humanistic school of thought, our choices can also create our pathways in our brain. By choosing, I will not allow myself the luxury of a negative thought anymore, or I will not allow people to treat me badly, or I'm going to make this choice to go do something to increase my skills, to make me feel better about myself. That can create the pathways in the brain. Okay, the final one. Psychoanalytic. Behavior is determined by our unconscious processes. And you know what I meant to have on here? Our childhood experiences. So we learned that psychoanalytical is the school of thought that really focuses on our um, childhood experiences. Well, let's go back to this picture. We know that we were born with all these nerve cells. And we know that we had basic pathways. But when did our big pathways get really firmly ingrained? If you think about it, they got ingrained in childhood. That's when our first pathways were laid. And once your first pathway is laid, it's we're back again. If you are in a car, are you going to get on the freeway or are you going to take the side streets? Of course, you say, well, I take the side streets if it's traffic, but we're not going that route. We're just going, what are you going to do? You're going to go on the freeway. And when are the freeways laid? They're laid during childhood. So does childhood have a big effect on programming our brain? Yes, of course it does. But I want to say that for, I want to stop for that for a minute. Is maybe some of you have had some really negative childhood experiences. You had a parent that always put you down. I mean, I'm hoping not. I'm hoping you guys can tell me, oh, I had a great parent, uh, a great childhood. However, unfortunately, a lot of people didn't. You know, their parents were overworked or, or overburdened or something, and so the children experienced neglect or something like that. Is if you had a negative childhood, to realize that, hey, let me question some of these things that I was told during my childhood that maybe I wasn't good enough or I couldn't do anything and maybe question that pathway that's there and say wait a minute that was my childhood this is now okay so let me just go back by showing you that what happens to the dendrites throughout life these dendrites let me just go back again okay here's the dendrites we learned these are the cell bodies the axons the dendrites what happens to these dendrites throughout life is they grow and retract. And how do they grow? They grow by our thoughts. And what influences our thoughts? Our choices, our environments that we allow ourselves in. And when were our first dendritic pathways set up? They were set up in our childhood. So hopefully you guys understand that from this lecture, I'm trying to show you that I can give credence to all five schools of psychology in the brain. So biological says, look, we're going to study behavior according to how the brain works. We wanted, This is how the brain works. And I started off and I said, look, biologically, we all know that we're kind of born with a certain body type. That's just we're born with a certain skin color, race, we're born with a certain body type. The brain is just an organ of the body, so our brain is probably naturally set up for certain things. But the environment that we're in can definitely change the patterning in our brains. 
Our thought process is what changes the patterning in our brains. Our choices affect our thought processes and our environment. And finally, our first pathways are laid in childhood. And the thickness of the pathways a lot of times will determine kind of maybe our unconscious ways of going. That's a really, um, what I just taught you is a really powerful thing. I, maybe you guys need to take a chance to think about it, but I think there's some really valuable lessons in here. And the valuable lessons that I want you to walk away with from this slide are that, one, um, your childhood, yes, it probably had a big impact on you by creating those large pathways. However, now at this time of life, you do have choices. And your choices are that you can control the thoughts. And instead of having a negative thought and allowing that negative thought to influence you, it's impossible to think two thoughts at once. So think positive instead of negative. I know it's easier said than done. And another thing to remember is, is that you know, the environment that we allow ourselves to be in can have a profound impact. If we choose to hang around with people that are bringing us down, being negative to us, or telling us, no, you shouldn't try that, or no, you shouldn't try this, or no, you shouldn't go for school, or something like that, then that can affect us. If we put ourselves in very stimulating environments where people are positive and they're saying, yes, you should get everything out of life that you can, and you should try this and try that to stimulate your brain, that can have a powerful impact too.